Together with Tommen, I'm super excited to be giving the viewers of Backstage Pass podcast the chance to win some really great gear for podcasting so that you can start your own podcast. Podcasting is a really cool way of sharing your interests and ideas with the world. And this gear will enable you to record your ideas, your thoughts, your feelings in the best quality possible. Plus, you can even record music with it too. For a chance of winning, let me know what topic you'd like to hear me talk about in the next episodes of Backstage Pass and subscribe to the Tom and Music channel. And good luck. You are listening to the Backstage Pass podcast, hosted by the wonderful Anna Trickwell and brought to you by the good people of Toman. Hello, Simon Pursehouse. Hello, how are you? I'm top fine, thanks. Banana. How are you doing? Top banana. <laughs> I'm top banana. It is a catchphrase I'm trying to bring back into uh, everyday usage. It was watching, do you remember the programme catchphrase? I mean, of course you do. Yeah, yeah. You, you don't forget it, it's still on. And I was watching it with my cousin and the catchphrase that they were trying to get was top banana. And no one could get it, obviously, because who says top banana? Uh, and then ever since then, <laughs> I've tried to make it my mission to stop saying top banana to everyone I meet. How nice. are you? Top banana. I'm fine, thanks. Yeah, I don't have a catchphrase though like that, which I'm going to, I need to try and come up with something, but my mind's gone blank. Well, it's always I... happens to me during a gig, you know, if there's a technical issue and you're supposed to say something funny to keep people going in the atmosphere. And I always just come out with the same joke, which is what do you call stolen cheese? It's nacho cheese, is it? It's nacho cheese. <laughs> it's nacho cheese. <laughs> It's just so bad. You are the global director of music services at I am. Centric. That's my haughty title. I am indeed. What does that mean? So my day, my day today at Centric is kind of split up into two different things. Firstly, I do a lot of business development. So I talk to a lot of artists, a lot of potential clients, a lot of catalogs, you know, new business uh, sales, I suppose. It's a dirty word, but it's kind of what it is um, and then the other side of things is I'm kind of the point person for our traditionally signed artists so at Centric we have many different clients and many different artists and many different songwriters ranging from those using our very kind of artist friendly anyone can join 28 day deal um, to artists we have traditional songwriting agreements with um, so I'm the point person for those guys I help with creative uh, input setting up co-writing sessions or we also have a lot of evergreen catalogue eccentric. So we have some massive copyrights ranging from all over the years. And I'm trying to bring new opportunities to those, you know, so getting people to sample them or remix them um, or feature them and get cuts that way as well. So, yeah, it's a mix of looking after the the music side of things at Centric. Um, a, lot, a lot of the creative is probably what I do day to day. And for people who don't already know, what is Centric? Centric Music is an independent music publisher. We have been going for 14 years now, um, and I've been there since the beginning, so I'm very much part of the furniture. It is a it's a university project that's got quite out of hand. Um, <laughs> we had to do that in the third year of our university course. We were studying kind of business management, music business management at a place called Lipper in Liverpool, and you had to do like a work placement in the real-life scary music industry. Um, for three months in your last year. So it's a gentleman called Chris Meehan, who is our CEO, um, which always sounds odd to say because he's just my scouse mate. Uh, he had this great idea of like a very artist-friendly music publishing kind of setup. Um, and we launched from there. So where we are now, there's 70 members of staff at Centric Altogether. Um, headquarters are still here in Liverpool and we've got offices in London, LA, New York, uh, Germany, Spain, all over the place. And we look after kind of well over a million copyrights, ranging from artists writing their first ever songs to artists who've sold millions and everywhere in between. So I think what most people know us for is the, this 28-day deal that I just alluded to. So if you're a songwriter yeah. and of any level, like you could be just writing your first ever song and performing it at local open mic nights, or you could be selling hundreds of thousands and everywhere in between. Um, we will look after your copyrights. We will register them all around the world. We will do all the terribly dull things that a good music publisher should do. Uh, but the kind of kicker is you can leave whenever you want and retain your copyright. So it's really 
really artist friendly. Uh, previously before us at Centric, there was no real way of doing that. Uh, obviously, you can join the PRS and the MCPS and be a member of a PRO, but they're only ever going to look after you for kind of one territory or they're going to look after you for one territory really well. Expecting mm. one PRO to look after you around the world because every major territory has got their own version. Um, they're not going to do that well. So at Centric, we take your copyrights, we register them with PRS and MCPS in the UK, with Gamer in Germany, Sassam in France, ASCAP, BMI, CSAC in America, like all over the world. So wherever you as a songwriter are getting streamed or playing gigs um, or getting played on TV, we're collecting that money for you, um, doing it really well. And yeah, I suppose that, that the kicker of being able to leave whenever you want with 28 days notice um, is kind of what made us stand out. And it's been a good platform for a lot of artists. It, people often see us as, oh, well, I'll use Centric until I get a traditional music publishing deal, whatever that is in this day and age. Um, so yeah. Art, yeah, artists such as, <laughs> you know, Louis Capaldi and Bastille and Blossoms and Idols and H and Young T and Bugsy and Little Sims, they all use that 28-day deal before they went and signed um, with different publishers. And that's cool, and that's fine for me to say all those ones who did very well. But, you know, there's been many artists who've gone and signed traditional deals who have not enjoyed it, haven't had that success. And as soon as they realise they don't own those copyrights anymore and they feel a bit trapped, then quite often when that deal's done, um, you find that they do come back to us and want to work with us again. Uh, so that's, I, there you go. That's nice. That's what I'd do. Sounds like there's a lot of manpower needed. Yeah, so there's I think there's a 70 of us now. We've um, Obviously, we're recording this in the midst of lockdown, um, and we've yeah. been quite fortunate that not only have we not had to furlough anyone, we've actually hired two members of staff during this lockdown, which has been interesting. Um, one thing that we hope we do over our competitors or you know, one thing that we get people saying about us is we always want to be here. We always want to be able to, you can call us, you can ask us a question. Um, one thing I hear about other publishers is that sometimes they do deals with them, with artists, and then, you know, they can't get in touch with anyone to make sure that a new song is registered Ghosted. or they can't get in touch with anyone who, uh, on the sync team to make sure they're pushing for um, opportunities there. So yeah, here at Centric, we always try and make sure that even though our catalogue is quite large, where the staff we have here is growing with that catalogue. Um, a hell of a lot of the catalogue we look after is pure administration. So it's just looking after the registrations, the collections, uh, the royalties. And for that, we've developed like quite a, a nifty piece of technology uh, called Rights App, which does a lot of that work. But we have an in-house tech development team who are working on that constantly. Um, but using that technology on that side of things allows the creative side of things to kind of flourish. So that customer service, that always being there at the end of a phone call or an email, um, the sync team are very readily available. You know, when I'm doing all my stuff, we're setting up co-writes and sessions and helping artists talk to each other. Um, yeah, we always want to be accessible to both our artists and our like business to business clients, really. How does that work when you're setting up co-write sessions? Do artists come to you and ask if there's someone that you think they would work well with? Or Yeah, so we do this more for our traditionally signed artists. So we do have some artists on three, five, you know, seven year deals. Um, setting up things like co-writes is quite tricky with artists on 28 day deals because we can do a lot of good work and then they could just get snapped up straight away by another publisher, um, which has yeah. happened before in the past. Quite frustratingly, I mean, there was one artist who, I think I got three cuts on a top 10 album and then six weeks later they'd left. And it was a bit like, well, we can't really do that for anyone unless we have them for a certain amount of time. Uh, but yeah, there's myself, there's a gentleman called Peter, uh, a lady called Mel, and so some of our traditionally signed artists who we worked with recently, uh, we have a guy called Kieran Shudall, who is the singer-songwriter from an artist called Circle Waves, who've had four top ten albums in the UK. Uh, we've got a guy called Joe Hamill, who is a singer and principal songwriter in an artist a band called Catelyn Kane, um, and with him we've had him co-writing with artists on the continent and he's had number ones and gold records in places like Belgium and this and the other. Um, so it's a mix of they can come to us and say, look, I really like that artist. I really like that songwriter. I'd like to get into touch with them and work with them and then we'll try our best, you know. Um, 
a big part of our job is to yeah. know other publishers, know other A&R people and say, like, we think these will be a really good fit. You know, this is our guy's one sheet. This is all the hits that he's had. This is the stuff that he's been working on. Um, and hopefully making sure that kind of happens. Yeah. And then there's sometimes people come to us saying, our new artist who we've just signed at this record label is looking for uh, someone who is a top liner or who is a finisher or, you know, who specializes in pop or house or dance. And then we can look at our roster of artists and say, well, you should definitely talk to this person, this person, um, and doing it that way. For me, yeah. being a songwriter has got to be the best job in the world because you get all the lovely music publishing income, but none of the hassle of having to perform live. <laughs> Do you play music? Um, I play the guitar exceptionally uh, badly. I think I can play and sing yeah. two songs, which is Folsom Prison Blues by Johnny Cash and Where Do You Go To My Lovely nice. by Peter Sardston. Um, I have never had any need nor want to kind of be on stage and perform in front of people. Like I love songs. I adore lyrics. I'm, like, I'm a lyric guy. Um, and there are some songwriters and artists who... I will listen to their songs, I will listen to their music and they will blow me away. And I just think, mm. I can't do that, so I'm not going to try. So I'd much rather work on this side of the business right. and try and help those people who can do that. I mean, I, I wrote one yes. song when I was 13 years old and it was called Summer Job and it had the lyric, and you can have this if you want, 5% and you can have it. Please. Um, <laughs> yeah. You're gambling away your future at the casino of life. Ooh. Yeah, ooh, indeed. Ooh, indeed. Um, so that's the, when I knew I wasn't I like a songwriter. It. Yeah. No, I like it. I think it's good. <laughs> I've, I've put a lot worse into some of my songs. So <laughs> <laughs> So you said it started at university. Yeah. Was it yeah. like a final year project? You said it was yeah. um, to yeah. get work experience, right? Yeah, so in the third year of that course, there was kind of three bits. You had your dissertation. Um, you had a thing called Contemporary Issues in Management, where you had to do a half an hour presentation in front of the whole three years of your course about whatever subject you want. Um, and then you had to do this three-month work placement. So Chris, whose idea it was initially, he was the academic year above me. But the class was really small. There was only about 20, 25 kids per class, so everyone kind of knew everyone. It was a big old bubble. Um, so he, in his year, he wrote the initial business plan, got it all together, got some funding, and then for the following year, asked me if I wanted to come on board and help start it, really. So, I mean, back then, I was all set to go work for XFM for my work placement because I had a big love affair with radio. I used to manage, I used to be the station manager for our university's radio station, and I just I just love radio. I always have done. Um, but when he said, do I want to do this? I just thought, well, if I do this, I know I'll be able to get stuck in and I'll get work to do. I think there's always that kind of concern that if you're going to do work experience somewhere that they might just make you photocopy stuff and make cups of tea <laughs> yeah, make so tea. I said exactly <laughs> yeah. so I said yes thinking it would be three months of my life and now it's been 14 years blimey O'Reilly well it seems like it's going well it is it is going well and we've still got a lot to do which is quite interesting you know we've we've managed to we've got a really good team of people at Centric everyone is uh seemingly very competent at their job um People like working at Centric, so so far as I can tell, you know, we don't have many people leave us whatsoever once they're here. Um, we get on, we have a fun bunch, we constantly do social things when we're allowed to see each other. And even through this social yeah. distancing, we've been doing lots of fun things as well. And, you know, making sure that everyone's kind of happy and having that positive, like, workplace environment is so important. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're... Where are we now? So we're just about to start our fourth five-year business plan, if you look at it that way. And wow. we're not planning on slowing down, really. We've got a lot of things that we'd like to do. So I'm, you probably know that I'm an artist on Centric and I use Centric and I love Centric. Um, I have seen and had some sync opportunities that mm. are available through Centric. Um one thing I wanted to ask just out of my own curiosity, where do those come from? Do like film companies come direct to Centric and say, this is what we want? Um, do you have any of this? And then you kind of put it out to the songwriters. Essentially that, yeah. So Sync is an interesting one in the sense that it's so tough and it's so competitive. 
And there's so many people yeah. trying to get sync. Um, and not just at Centric, as in every other publisher, every other record label, anyone who has any interest or invested in any copyrights wants syncs to happen. So you're up against the entire music industry when you're doing this. Um, every single artist that comes on board at Centric gets listened to and then kind of rated in terms of suitability for what kind of syncs. Um, so if you know the biggest barrier to entry is production quality so like is it recorded well like we can't send demos or rough mixes or anything that's unmastered to music supervisors because they won't listen to them they don't care if we keep sending them things they they have to be like finished product yeah yeah definitely unless unless they specifically request we're looking for a track which might be coming out in like six to nine months time and we're happy to accept demos at the moment but that is so rare it's so so rare they want to hear that kind of final finished product. I think the good thing to remember is that different people have got different ears for different needs. So what a sync person or a music supervisor is looking for in a song is so different to what an A&R person or a radio plugger or a PR person is looking for. Um, like I can't do anything yeah. with demos. Like We just need that final product. A good example of that is um, a good friend of mine is an A&R person. And years ago, we were in his car and I was flicking through his iPod. Do you remember iPods? Old school. Yes. And he had like, he had the first ever demo version of, do you know the song Time to Pretend by MGMT? Yes. Um, so, da, 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 great record. Um, but this first ever demo version sounded awful because it was just a demo. So someone like me working right. in sync would just go, no, can't do anything with that. On to the next one. But his job as an A&R person is to hear that kind of potential in that track and say, oh, you know, maybe with that producer in that studio, it could become what that song became, which was a really syncable track. Um, So one of my big kind of tips to artists is when you're looking for that kind of sync side of things is really hold back until you know you have the best product you have. You know, the songs that you are writing now, if you compare them to the songs that you wrote 24 months ago, I'm sure there's times where you kind of cringe and you think, what was I thinking? Like you develop, you blossom as a songwriter. <laughs> you you know what you right. your ability is. And we've had artists where, you know, they've waited, they've waited 12, 18 months um, from them being a band until they've actually recorded their first song and got it across to us, which is then really good mm. quality, which we've then managed to go and get on an advert for UK and Ireland and has made them lots of money over the past few years. Um, it's tough because as an artist, you want your tracks to, used straight away because you want them on tv because of the exposure and the money but yeah holding off until it's ready is really important so back to my original point uh yes of what you're saying we kind of do proactive and reactive briefs so we average over a i think it was last year we did over 1300 briefs so over 1300 times people got in touch with us which could be an advertising agency it could be a tv station it could be a music supervisor saying i am looking for this what have you got which works and it could be sometimes it's just as simple as i want coldplay i can't afford coldplay what have you got that sounds like coldplay uh sometimes it's just like three or four paragraphs of absolute nonsense uh where you've got to try and read between the lines and deduce what this creative is thinking of with their their vision which is a 60 second cabris cream egg advert um and then (laughs) sometimes sometimes it will be something that we actually already represent and they'll say we want to use that you know can we negotiate and talk about fees and this that, and the other so mm. we pitch our best stuff i would say we try and pitch no more than five to ten tracks per brief to the client because bearing in mind that when they're getting in touch with us they're also getting in touch with every other publisher and record label that they're chummy with so they might receive 500 tracks every time they send a brief out so you want to make sure that you're sending yeah. the real good stuff and it's never just like, here's some tracks. It's always, here's some tracks, and this is the reason why you should listen to it. So this artist has just been playlisted on Radio 1. This artist uh, has just played Glastonbury. This artist has got a really cool review on Pitchfork or Gorilla vs. Bear. So if anyone has ever said anything nice about your music in that world, you have to let the sync team at Centric know, and not just the sync team at Centric, but anyone helping or working your music needs to know when someone says something nice about it because that little thing will might be the reason why the music supervisor clicks on your track over someone else's. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So like, I think the line to take away there is tastemakers respect tastemakers' tastes. 
Um, mm-hmm. You know, when I'm sending, we've worked with some incredible uh, grime and trap music from like, at the moment, we've got artists like Miss Banks and Coco, we've got Toddler T. And me sending that, fine. I mean, I'm wearing a cap, but what do I know? Do you know what I mean? If you say that this has been one extra's track of the week for the past three weeks and Charlie Sloth did a fire in the booth with him and this, that, and the other, all those reasons and justifications for them listening to that track over the 500 other hip hop tracks have just been sent and hopefully will be the reason why they pick yours. It's interesting when you say tastemakers respect other tastemakers' opinions. Like, um, as an independent artist, I've sometimes wondered whether spending money that I've spent on press was the right thing to do if you're just solely looking at, like, you know, let's say that you get an amazing review in a very respected online music blog. Yeah. But it doesn't necessarily translate all the time to like streams and direct sales. But like you say, if you can pass that information along to to the rest of your team, I've had situations where I've been thinking, well, this like in terms of like streams and sales, it's not really made a difference, but then something else has come along because of what that person has said. Yeah. It's tricky. Yeah, I get that. Having, you know, being an emerging independent artist where, let's be honest, you know, you've not got the old magic money tree. So whatever cash you do have, you need to invest it really wisely. It's tough to say what's happened. Like PR and plugging. I mean, radio plugging, I've got friends who work in that and it can be, sometimes you can give them two grand and then six weeks later, they can come back and just say, oh, no one liked it. And that's that's the weirdest way to spend two grand you could ever really think of. In fact, (laughs) With, with that I think that's mind. the majority of situations with radio pluggers. Because there's only so many spots, you know, per week on the radio as it is anyway. Exactly. Super competitive. And, and you, you're using their relationships with those radio producers in order just to get listened to, which is a hard bit, really. Mm. Um, we did a, there's a blog on the Centric website called, if I was an emerging artist and had £1,000 to spend, then I would dot, dot, dot. And we asked loads of people in we asked lawyers and music supervisors and A&R people and pluggers and uh, record labels, like basically anyone who I've talked to over the past 14 years chucked in what they would do if they were an artist and they had a grant to spend in this day and age. We've actually done that blog three times every two years because obviously the industry changes, uh, the landscape shifts, and what yeah. you would spend a grand on now is probably different to what you would spend a grand on two years ago, if not four years ago. So I'd really recommend checking that yeah. out because... Obviously, most people give answers kind of leaning towards their area of the business. Uh, but I always think it's really interesting to read what everyone would do with, you know, a nominal amount of like a thousand pounds. And yeah, so yeah, the sync team at Centric, again, you know, that's a big part of what I do. But it's, it's sales, it's, it's getting the opportunity um, to put our artist music in front of these music supervisors. So, you know, it's, it's, being friendly with them, it's being chummy, it's buying them coffees and dinner every so often um, because they have too much music. Music supervisors have too much music, full stop. They don't need more music. It's only going to get worse as well, isn't it? Exactly. So you have to befriend them. Well, worse. I mean, there's only going to be so... (laughs) There's going to be more and more music available, isn't there? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. One One of my things about the music industry, which is like simultaneously both my favourite and yet my most frustrating thing of it is the fact that out there at the moment, there will be 10, say 10 songs, which if I heard would change my life, absolutely blow me away. So I remember years ago, a long time ago, best must be over a decade ago, I went to the local little art house cinema in Liverpool called Fact because they were showing a movie which we managed to get a song synced on. It was like one of our first movie syncs. So I was dead giddy and it was like, an independent movie, which was being shown once at this cinema, like one showing, see it or you don't see it. So we went and I watched it and you know, our song was like really like hidden in the background, but it was there and it was a moment. And it was like, oh yeah, our first like movie sync. Uh, but on this movie, there was a guy, the protagonist kept listening to this one song over and over again. And it was amazing, right? And it was about a song called It Takes a Muscle to Fall in Love by an electronic Dutch duo called spectral display and it came out in the 70s like 1974 okay and it was amazing i probably fell in love with it gone up listen to it it's amazing so that song had been out literally 
30 years since before I was born. Well, not 30 years. I'm not that young. Christ. 10 years before I was born, that song came out. It's been there every single day of my life. And it, but it took me discovering it on this movie to hear it and then go, oh my God, this is amazing. So if that's happened before, then yeah, there's 10 songs out there in the world at the moment that I want to hear because it will change my life. But how on earth do you find them? You know, this as an emerging artist, it, it must be so frustrating in the sense that there is so much music, there's so much good music out there that deserves to make a living for the person that's making it. Like people deserve to stream your music, to buy your gig tickets, to buy your merch, uh, to buy your physical records. But there's only so much of that they can buy and there is so much music out there. And the part of the struggle as an emerging artist yeah. is, is floating to the top of that sea of good music out there. Um, and there is no, you know, Do like... Do you believe right that the cream answer. rises... I think yes and no. Yes, in the sense that I think truly exceptional artists, and I'm talking like once in a lifetime kind of talents that really, really rarely come about, they don't need to worry because people will bend over backwards to work for them and work with them to get them out there. And they may be troublesome in their own way. They may be hard to work with, but ultimately they're just so good at what they do, it'll be fine. The The kicker is the rest of it is that, it's the other millions of artists out there who make music that I would buy, but I can only buy so many. But like, why do I choose that person over that person? And it's those artists, that's the fight. Um, that's the battle they're fighting, really, to try and get my £10 on vinyl or whatever it is I'm going to spend on them. In terms of, like, grabbing attention for you as somebody, you know, trying to find something for sync obviously it depends on the song and the brief and everything like that but is there a do you believe there's a certain number of seconds before you switch off uh, a little bit yeah so there's there's so much music out there again Patrick just said three or four yeah. times um and depending on what kind of syncs you're going for depends on how you're going to listen to music so the vast majority of the kind of the big ticket syncs which are you know adverts that you'll see on tv all around the world you know your apples and your any major brands you know car adverts and stuff ultimately they're all trying to tell a story in usually 30 seconds sometimes a minute sometimes 20 seconds so your music or the music that gets put on that needs to be like once heard never forgotten it just needs to be hooks yeah um as you can imagine over the past 14 years of my life the sentence that has been said the most to me is i think this is really syncable when an artist gets in touch with me and you always think, well, you know, it's, it's almost like going to the doctor and telling the doctor what you've got, even though they've not told you yet. <laughs> Everyone um, does that, though. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like Google is your enemy in that sense. Um, yeah. You know, there's certain there's certain artists and there's certain tracks that we've worked with over the years, which um, we just can't stop syncing. You know, there was one artist called Saint Motel who had a song called My Type that had this big saxophone riff at the beginning. And once you'd heard those eight notes or whatever it was, you're never forgetting that. And that's an advertiser's dream. Do you think that's something that songwriters should do? That they should like put the a hook at the beginning or the chorus at the beginning of the song? That's a fantastic question. And no, I think as a songwriter, you should always be making art for art's sake, right? As soon as you start writing yeah. or making music, in the back of your mind going, oh, that'd be good for sync, then people will just see through it straight away. Um, we've had artists, there was one artist, I won't name them, um, who we did really well for, got them lots of syncs. It became their source of income. Uh, they quit their job and became a full-time musician thanks to the money that we made them from sync. Um, and it was beautiful singer-songwriter stuff, worked very well on uh, US TV uh, and this, that and the other. And, you know, as the nature of sync is, we went 12 to 18 months without landing him a deal. Oh, I said him. Oh, well, without landing him a deal. I mean, uh, it's, it's still fine. very big. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And obviously, we sort of get a little bit panicky and this and the other. And he sent over like a new EP. And the new EP he just made thinking about sync. So there was like hand claps and whistles and ukuleles in it. And it was terrible. It was just so see through. And it wasn't him as an artist. And right. ultimately, people want that, you know, we, there's this two worlds of sync. There's commercial music and production music. Um, production music, also known as library music, is music that is made for sync. So it's off the shelf. 
Um, the price is non-negotiable. Everything costs the same, and it's just all about picking the right track. And that's a huge industry within itself. Um, but we work in mm. commercial sync, which is essentially artists who are making music that is being released and streamed and gigged and played on the radio. We then try and earn them extra income by getting that used on TV, adverts, games, movies, etc. Um, so yeah. yeah, it helps. It helps having radio edits or sync edits of stuff. You know, you might send over a track where the build up you know, three and a half minutes in, um, has got an amazing hook in there and it's got a lyric which maybe really resonates in sync. So at the moment, thanks to this situation that we're in, we're getting asked for a lot of music, which is about coming together, which is about overcoming adversity, about family, about non-romantic love, uh, which is one that comes mm. up quite a lot. So if you said, oh, on from three minutes onwards, there's a drop and then it builds up really nicely with some strings and I keep saying the words again and again, I'll be there for you, but not like the French theme tune. Um, <laughs> then make an, make an edit of that and send that across. And so, so when I click play, that's what I hear straight away. Because again, right. if you put yourself in that music supervisor's position, they've got 500 tracks to listen to. They're not going to skip through to three and a half minutes if it doesn't grab their attention in the first 30 seconds. Um, so mm-hmm. there's little tricks you can do to, to kind of help stand out. Uh, but yeah, don't, don't write your personal art with sync in mind. If you want to write some stuff for library or production, then cool. But like make music that you want to make, definitely. I heard recently through the grapevine, um, but from like a, a major label social media team, mm-hmm. um, that they felt like it was a good idea to post regularly, but strip your social media back like once a week to make sure that there was nothing there that was like weaker than the other posts or was resonating and and being engaged with way less than all the other posts, which leads me on to my question of, do you think that it's important for people to do that when it comes to having music available on Centric or for Sync? Should they only have their best stuff available or do you think just everything you've ever done put it out there this there's two trains of thought there one in the sense that you should utilize centric's service with anything you've ever performed live or ever released so it's been streamed so even if that's two three hundred tracks again back to that thing before about even if the quality is not the best you've ever done if it's being streamed it's generating publishing income if it's being played live it's generating publishing income so that needs to be collected yeah in terms of sync yeah it really helps if you give us the best stuff um you know, if you're approaching someone for the first time in this world, you know, two tracks at the most in terms of these are the best ones uh, for these kinds of reasons, it really does help. And having that kind of social media side, if I come across something which I really like, the first thing I will do is look at it on the Spotify about profile. I don't think artists utilize that enough, like the about you on Spotify. A lot of people look at that. That'll be the first port of call, really, because on there. A lot of those seem to be empty. Yes, a lot of them are, which is quite daft because that's the first port of call you go to to find the links to their Facebook and their Twitter and their Instagram. So usually I have a look on there, read their bio. Personally, it kind of turns me off when artists use all the social media platforms going, but then maybe neglect two of them. So they might be amazing on Twitter and they've got a Facebook profile, an Instagram profile, but they never use it or they don't update it or it's it's pointless. Like pick... Pick the social media platform that you're good at, that you're comfortable with, because each one's got its own, you know, foibles and idiosyncrasies and, you know, use it well. And it's an interesting time for social media because thanks to thanks to your man, Louis Capaldi, who is genuinely an absolutely hilarious human being, you found that like a hell of a lot of artists were trying to emulate that, which only works if you are also funny. Because <laughs> if you're not, right. it just becomes a bit cringeworthy, doesn't it? Um, and sometimes, you know, do you mean the the like zooming in on his face thing when he's being like a bit crazy? (laughs) People in the office or anyone close to me will this sentence will resonate with them. But when you try and be funny and you're not funny, it's hard work to be around. And I apologize to all the loved ones in my life who have to put up with me for thirty four (laughs) years. Um, But yeah, but we have artists who have aren't very good at social media, and they know they're not. So their whole angle on it is, you know, playing, being quite mysterious. So there's there's not much information up there whatsoever. 
Um, but just yeah. if the branding's really cool and it looks great, then that can be a real turn on as well because you know you, you want to know more. You, you have that air of mystery and you're like, oh, this is interesting. Um, I mean, yeah. it does does always come down to the music, like. Uh, but yeah, back to what you're saying, being selective is is really important. Like helping our job is to help music supervisors get the best stuff for their projects. So if our artists can help us get the best stuff um, and send us their two, three best tracks instead of sending us 300 for sync, um, then that's going to really help. If we want to hear more, we will be knocking on your door saying, these three are amazing. What else have you got in this area, in this area? Um, do you, will you work on something for us? You know, every so often we'll give our artists um, kind of briefs to do where, so at the moment we're getting asked as a sync team a hell of a lot for things like... Uh, DJ Shadow, who has just been synced everywhere. Um, so there's a couple of artists that we've given that task to who make music in a similar sort of world, saying, can you give us something which has got those scratches in there, those break beats, those brass stabs, you know, something that kind of party vibe. Um, and that can result in, in good syncs happening as well. Is there any kind of production house parts of Centric that, that get a brief for a sync and think, oh, let's make that? Not really. We reach out to certain artists, like I just said, um, if yeah. we're getting something. And usually we'll reach out if the artists themselves have said to us, like, you know, what what are you getting asked for at the moment? I don't mind giving it a go and making something. Like, time is a commodity, and I really don't like telling artists to go and make us things if the chances of them getting used are as tough as getting a sync is. So, like, if they genuinely have time and they want to give it a go, great. It's good to have that in our kind of arsenal. But again, with us working on commercial sync rather than production music or library, we really only kind of push stuff that's being made for the sake of being made, you know, art for art's sake. Uh, one thing that we do get made is um, covers. So some of our bigger copyrights, our evergreens, as they're called, we look after artists, uh, we look after songs such as It's the Most Wonderful Time of the Year, Young Hearts Run Free, um, Ghostbusters, You Make Me Feel Mighty Real. <laughs> Um, we look after the Sugar Hill Gang and Grandmaster Flash, so like, but the message and white lines and big old copyrights yes. like that. And we'll quite often get our artists to do covers of those because we can then pitch them. Well, the artists will retain the master rights that they own those, but obviously we administer that publishing right already. And that allows us to say to, to brands, like, this song is so well known, it's going to cost you a lot of money to use this song as everyone knows it, the original, but if you use this cover version, we can save you some money on the master rights and then still make money from the publishing side of things, if that makes sense. Um, mm. So yeah, we often get covers done. And I mean, you know quite quite a lot about covers, if I remember rightly. No, I don't know no? what you're talking about. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you can upload covers to Centric? No. <laughs> we can only... Okay. We can only work with covers of copyrights that we already control. So if you cover any of those songs ah, that I just mentioned, we then we can push them. Right. But one of the things that you should do is all the covers that you've made before, you should find out who the publishers are for those original songs and give them your version and say, oh, look, I've got a version of this song. Because those sync teams might want to then go and push that and potentially make you some money from sync. Ah, top there tip. You go. Full of them. Centric is free to join. Like anyone can use it. Um, you just go to centricmusic.com and there's been many, many times that we've changed an artist. Uh, well, we've helped an artist make music become their career and not their hobby anymore, which is easily one of the most satisfying things of this job. Um, you know, you look after all these massive copyrights and you can do what you want for them and they do well and everyone's very happy. But hearing, getting that email from an artist who said, oh, I've just quit my job because of the money that you've made me is is amazing. And that's... Uh, I'll, oh, emerging music will always be kind of like at, at my heart in terms of what we do at Century. Unfortunately, we are out of time, mm. but I would like to ask you, what is your track of the week? What is my track of the week? Oh, there's two I'm listening to a lot at the moment. Can I have two? That's cheating, isn't it? One, okay. My track of the week. Yeah, yeah, you can have two. You can have okay. two. What, what's your main track of the week? I'm going to say there is an artist from Liverpool called Harm, H-A-A-R-M. Um, and they released a song recently called Take Me Away. And it basically sounds like someone's pouring sunshine directly into your ears. Wow. That's a bold statement. 
it's got it starts off with a great steel drum riff. So what I was talking about that whole once heard, hard to forget, and it's like caught. It's yeah. a perfect kind of like strutting pace. So when you're listening to it in the sunshine, walking down the street, um, it's been keeping my my daily allowed exercise. It's been keeping me occupied and keeping me company nice. on those walks. So take me away by harm. I would thoroughly recommend it. No, what's your track? What's of my track of the week? Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I've this isn't a new track, although I think it came out about five or six weeks ago. But I really like "Old Soul" by Bruno Major. I've not listened to that yet. Um, I'll give it a go after this. It's it's full of old soul. So okay. there's like a lot of vinyl crackle stuff in there. There's um, like the way that the guitars and the vocals have been recorded. It it just kind of takes you back in time a bit, and it's very wholesome. And authentic and organic sounding and I'm like a massive fan of pop like pure yeah. like heavy pop yeah. but this is so extremely the other way that it grabbed my attention for that reason if that makes sense well two things on that then one check out an artist called Nick Waterhouse he's one of our traditionally signed writers and he makes all his music with analog gear or like 50s and 60s sounding soul R&B rock and roll Ooh. He is one of yeah. our most synced artists ever. Like, he is incredible. Wow. Such a good songwriter, so check him out. And then just talking about I Am A Fellow, I love a pop song. Um, the new Dagny song and the new Kim Petras song. Both absolute joyous three and a half minutes of <laughs> pop gold. Nice. And then for my final question, what is the best lesson that you've learned in your career so far? Um, I would say the best lesson I've learned in my career so far is to work smarter, not harder. Those four words, someone said them to me, what must be nearly a decade ago now, and they really resonated with me. There's kind of, there's no use in being a busy fool. Um, the music industry, both as an artist and as someone who works in the business side of things, being busy is like a strange badge of honour. Whereas every time I meet mm. someone I've not seen for a while, you know, I will say, how how are you? How are you doing? And everyone's go-to answer is, oh, I'm so busy. And I don't like that. Like, you don't have to prove anything to me by saying you're so busy. Life is too short. Um, people need to really look after their mental health a hell of a lot more than what they do as a society. And I think even more so within the world of music industry, where because it's a passion industry and people who work in it love it um they'll sometimes mm. throw themselves in it that little bit too much and need to kind of like step back and working smarter not harder um is something that's really stuck with me so you can achieve a hell of a lot more by thinking about what you're doing rather than just spreading yeah. yourself so thin so that that would be my piece of advice yeah i definitely agree with that although it took me a long time to come to that as well well this is such an odd time as well again you know we are recording mm. this during week eight or nine of lockdown and there's a really weird this again this kind of expectation Someone that you it should be achieving productivity yes a toxic productivity exactly like there will be people <laughs> on there out there who are now making the best bread they've ever made and someone who has started writing a novel and if you've not done that it doesn't fucking matter. Like, it's fine. Just getting through this, these unprecedented times. I saw someone else tweet Ugh, the other day that. saying, <laughs> I, I really miss precedent at times, which made me laugh a lot. Um, <laughs> just surviving and existing is fine. You know, there is nothing wrong mm. with how you choose to do it. Whatever gets you through this. This is a weird, weird time to be alive. And like, you've got yeah. to look after your mental health. Um, yeah. And also, uh, we all know this, but sometimes you just need to be reminded it the lives you see on your friends' social media is not their lives. It is the most hand-picked, cherry part of their existence. You know, no one is that happy all the time. Mm -hmm. They're only showing you the very, very good bits. Um, so stop comparing yourself to other people. Ooh, while I'm on it, why not? One thing I started doing <laughs> this last year, I now don't look at my phone after half nine and it charges in the living room rather than my bedroom. That absolute game changer. Ooh, you sleep so yeah. much better because you're not just staring at it. You're not 
you know, giving yourself some endorphin hit before you go to bed so you can't switch off. And then there's nothing worse than just waking up and then straight away just zombieing straight to your phone. No mm. need for that. Um, so really recommend that. I'm genuinely thinking about going back to the the BlackBerry that I used to have 10 years ago. So I, so my phone just becomes like text calls and emails. Um, I, I honestly, I bought one I've, on I've eBay I've heard a lot of for people saying quid. that recently as well. I like, I mean, I love, I love Twitter. You know, I, I am on Twitter regularly. <laughs> I, Twitter makes me laugh. You know, I, I, I'm quite keen on curating Twitter. So it's just whimsy. Like I've stopped following anything yeah. remotely political or current affairs. I basically, if I were open Twitter, I just want to giggle for a bit. I want to laugh at dogs mm. jumping into puddles or drunken pigs rolling down a hill. And that's great. But I don't <laughs> go on Facebook anymore. I'm not that bothered about Instagram. <clears throat> like social media is, if you don't consciously kind of curate it for what it could be, it just gets on top of you. And it's, it's no wonder yeah. our generation, and I am saying our, because I'm only 34. I am still a millennial just. Um, <laughs> it's no wonder we're all like so much more socially aware of mental health issues than we've ever have been before. I think because the taboo's going in terms of being able to talk about them. But I also think, you know, this is getting well off topic, but I'll just, this, I'll, this is the last thing I'll talk about. I read a piece no, recently. it's good. I read a piece recently that um, I think it's about 300 years ago. If you spend 25 minutes flicking through your phone on all the social media platforms, you take in more information in that half an hour than what you would have done in a full lifetime 300 years ago. And you think about that. And it's at first I was like, how wow. can that work? But oh, that's if, you wanted, if you wanted to know what every single one of your friends or followers or people that you look, after, look at on those platforms are doing, you would have to send correspondence. You would have to write every single one of them a letter. They'd have to reply to you. So so that's why you do get that much information so quickly. And we're not built for that. We are not made to have that much information running around in our brains. Um, mm. Switch off. I turned my phone off last weekend for a full 48 hours. It was amazing. Last year, I went on holiday by myself and I turned my phone off for four days. I texted my girlfriend and my family. Wow. I was like, well, I'm going to turn my phone off. So I's I'm going off grid. And there is there is something so key in the actual turning the phone off rather than just like yeah. leaving it on silent in the corner, knowing that people can still get in touch with you. Just turn it off. What's going to happen? The world's going to carry on turning. Someone might die. They're not going to not die if your phone's on, are they? So <laughs> just doing that really set my mental health. Such a good holiday. I, I can't recommend mm-hmm. it enough. Four days by yourself, me, books. I went to an adults-only hotel in Ibiza, not your beef, from Yorker. And it Ooh, clearly wasn't, it wasn't adults only. <laughs> well, I know it sounds sexy, doesn't it? But the adults only <laughs> should have been, it should have read German pensioners only. Like I was the youngest person there for like 40 <laughs> years. But it was great because it oh, was wow. so quiet. Oh, I can't wait to do that again. Yeah, but I think that's a good, I think that's a good lesson to learn. It, a good life lesson. I hope as so. well as career lesson, definitely. Yeah, being busy is not a badge of honour. Thanks very much for speaking to me. It's been awesome. No, thank you for having me. I hope uh, I hope something was useful. It was very useful. All of it was great. Right. right. Uh, speak to you soon. Thanks for tuning in to this episode. Be sure to hit subscribe and leave a comment to let us know what you think. And I will see you next time on Backstage Pass. Backstage Pass.